Recently, during a visit to Nantucket, we found a wonderful antique store that also features fine wines. Could be a dangerous combination. We found a wonderful painted corner hutch. We'll take you there next to show you that piece, and then we'll come back here and build one right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Well, not far off this busy street in downtown Nantucket is Reed's Antiques. Out here, they have a couple outside pieces, sort of cast iron ends that have been painted with this green color and then capped off with some kind of a hardwood that appears to be beech. And over here across the way is another very hard piece, a big chunk of Connecticut granite. And I was told that it was actually an old millstone. Now, you want to make sure that when you set a piece like this in place, it's where you want it to be, because you don't want to have to move it every day. Now, inside, there's a great collection of French antiques. Ah, this is such a great place. And this would be Everett Reed. Good to meet you, Norm. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thank you. So what's the story here? You've mixed wine and antiques. Well, it's sort of a fun combination. Um, my wife has been buying uh, wines for many years now, and, and we've been selling them. And uh, we've uh, been collecting antiques over the years, and uh, we thought the combination two would work uh, would be a fun combination and work well. Sounds good to me. Let's take a look at what you've okay. got here in the shop today. And the first thing I notice are these leather chairs. I just built my first piece of upholstered furniture, which was leather. We call it a cigar chair. What would these be used for? These are, are really wonderful little French chairs that would be put um, in front of a fireplace where you could have, you know, a sherry. Um, and they're, have, they have a little deco-ish sort of uh, um, form to them, but they're just terrific chairs and um, they work for all sizes. They look small, but they're actually pretty comfortable. Now, you got to tell me what the story is on this copper tub. This is an amazing piece of This work. is a great piece. This, this was one of my follies, I'm afraid. This was a purchase in Paris. Um, it's around 1880, 1890. Um, it's zinc lined, and uh, it's just a really fun, terrific piece. And Boy, it's all hand hammered, too. Nice. It's going to look terrific in someone's home. Now, this caught my eye, this table right here, all inlay. Beautiful wood. It burl walnut, um, a little mahogany inlay, um, and it's just, it's a great tilt top table. It's nice to just look at the wood. It's yeah. beautiful. Now, how about, uh, you got tables that are a little simpler than this? We do. We actually have some tables that we purchased in France. Um, these are actually burgundy wine tasting tables. Um, this is an unusual one because of, of the oval shape. Yeah. Usually they're rounder. Um, these are very great. They were usually put in the cellars. Um, where the winemakers would, mm -hmm. would, would certainly um, would, would taste um, their wares with the prospective clients. And the wood? The wood is cherry, which is also unusual. So now this looks like there's a support system that allows it to flip down. Exactly. When the wine tastings were concluded, the um, table would actually flip up and then be placed in the corner. Great. Out of the way. Great. A great, a great uh, space saver. Now what about this mirror that's hanging near the stairway? Is that a... An antique piece? Well, it, the wood is um, the wood's probably 1890, 1900. Um, it's original paint on the wood. The glass itself is old, but it's been cobbled together in that sense. Oh, so so old. you're using older materials and making it, um, a great piece. And I think it's just got great character to it. Has a nice look. You can and never reproduce that kind of paint it's effectively. It's really difficult to. Wow, and this be the wine area. This is, um, this is the wine room. This is Linda's room. Well, and you've got wine displayed everywhere. You've got some across this mantle. We do. It's a, it's a fun way to sort of incorporate the antiques with the wine, and uh, people respond very favorably to it. Yeah, you got um, some on a table here. And what about this uh, piece right here? The this touch. is a French, it's called a shepherd's cupboard, um, and this is another fun way of displaying wine. Yeah, I'll tell you, the wine looks great in there. And over here, another piece, or maybe it's two pieces? Two yeah. pieces. Um, a Danish, uh, Danish cupboard below. Mm -hmm and a Welsh on top. And uh, plenty of room for the wine. Yeah, exactly. How about in here? Uh, another room where we have a variety of um, different pieces. Some American, these are some nice reproduction Windsors. Uh, we have an American step back hutch. And then um, another painted piece there. And another painted cupboard here. This is um, Pennsylvania. Now those look like milk paints. Are they milk paints? They are. On those? Well, one piece that caught my eye is this one here over in the corner, sort of a, a corner cupboard, but a little smaller than what I'm used to seeing. It is, and that's a very unusual in that sense. They've used, once again, older wood, mm -hmm. um, 
to, to create something that I think is a very practical piece in terms of its size. Mm. Um, it's very versatile and it's a two-piece unit, which is, I think, very, very important for the smaller houses on mm. Nantucket where, um, you know, you... <laughs> you got to squeeze things into tight spaces. Exactly. exactly. Well, we like pieces like this, one, because they're in two pieces, which makes them easy to move around, and two, because they are smaller and they right. will fit into nice small spaces. So, uh, do you mind if I take a few measurements and maybe a few digital pictures? It's all yours. All right, then I'll check out the wine when Great. I'm done. Great. Let's open a bottle. Well, here it is, our version of that painted corner hutch. Visitors to the shop love the proportions. It'll fit in a tight corner. They like this shelf rather than having the face of the cabinet go straight up. I built it in two sections so that it's easy to move around. And it can be painted so you can match it to your decor. The carcasses are made out of plywood. The face frame and doors are made out of poplar. There's a lot of soft edges, quad around moldings. The edges of the door are eased. There's a distinctive arch in the door frame as well as in the door panel. Now the hinges were a lucky find and we'll tell you where to get those in the measured drawing, which you'll hear more about before the program ends. Let's get started today building the carcasses. Now here's a piece of three quarter inch birch plywood and I've laid out the bottom shelf for the lower unit. Now I can't cut this on my table saw, so I'm gonna use my small circular saw. Before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear safety glasses. With my table saw set up with the dado, I'm now working on the back corners of the carcass, also made out of three quarter inch birch plywood. That first groove is for the bottom shelf. Now I'll set up to make a groove for the middle shelf. With my sacrificial fence installed, I'm able to make a rabbit. This rabbit is at the top of the panels for the upper case. It will receive that top shelf. Now there's two dados in the middle for these shelves and one at the bottom for the bottom shelf. I've just made a couple dados in the bottom of the top of our lower carcass. That will receive the side panels. Now while the dado is still set up, I want to put a groove down the back of this plywood style as well as this poplar style. The parts of the carcass are assembled with glue and screws. Now an easy way to locate the holes for those screws is to first drill holes in the dado facing up. You don't have to draw a line. Then I just flip it over and make the countersink. Now it's not a bad idea before committing to glue and screws to do a dry fit. Make sure all the pieces fit correctly. It's worth the time. You don't want to have to start adjusting later. I'm going to set this side in place. Okay, now for the other piece. Drop that in. Now I can pre-drill for my screw. And I like to use these inch and five-eighths deck screws. They're a little heavier shank than drywall, drywall screws, and they don't snap off. I'm using brads to connect the side panel to the top. I don't want to have screws showing. Now for the remaining two shelves, it's just a matter of some more glue, getting them set and driven into place. And then a few more screws. Now for the uppercase. More glue in the dados. And what I'm going to do is just set one of these pieces in the groove and then tip it up onto the other side. Basically use that as a gauge to make sure I've got it positioned in the right place. And then I'll attach it with some screws. The edges of some of the shelves show, so I want to cover them. These two and the one down below. So I've ripped some pieces of quarter-inch poplar, applied glue, and I'll secure them with some brass. Let's make some face frames. Four pieces of wood joined together. And what I'm going to use to make the joint is pocket screw joinery. We've used that before, and we've often cut the joints with an electric machine. 
But this time we're going to use a very simple jig made out of plastic. It has a bushing on one end. doesn't matter which way I set it in this direction, but I do want it to be flush on the end. I clamp it in place. And then I'll drill the hole using this step drill. There's a pilot drill on the end, and this creates the pocket and a stop so it goes the right distance. Now, there are a couple different types of screws to secure the joint. Each screw has this flat head, and that's very important because all the stress is going to be against that part of the screw. Now, I found that if I try to hold the pieces freehand while I screw them together, they move. So what I like to do is apply a little glue on each end and then set them in some clamps and make sure that everything is nice and even and in the right place. Okay, now I can take it out of the clamps. And I gotta say, I don't know of a better way or easier way to make a really strong face frame. I set the assembled face frame up against the carcass and this piece which has a groove in it which goes along the corner here. And the issue is that I have to join these two pieces together. So I have to make a miter cut, 22 and a half degrees in this case. Okay, we're getting close. Now when we bevel this piece, the two will come together. So well, let's see how we did. And I'd say once that's glued and nailed, it's gonna be fine. Well, now it's time for some assembly, and I'm going to put this piece on first and secure it with some inch and a half brads. Now a nice bead of glue on that lighter joint. We'll slip the two pieces together. And finally, the other corner, which will complete the face frame on the base unit. I've tipped the carcass upside down, and there's no mechanical attachment between the rail and the top. If I take some scraps of plywood and put glue on two edges, slip them behind that rail, and secure it with a couple brads, I'll have a good solid connection. I'm not going to put any nails across the top of this rail. The glue will hold it together. You may recall that the styles for the upper face frame started out as wider pieces. I put a dado in the piece to wrap the side of the cabinet, and now by making two 22 degree cuts, it folds around on itself and it'll fit the profile of the cabinet. A little bit of glue, and I'll secure this with some inch and a quarter brads. All right, we're off to a good start. Tomorrow, we'll put some molding up at the top, take care of the shelf edge, put on some base, and make some doors. That ought to be fun. Oh, good morning. I'm getting started today making some of the molding profiles at my router station. I just took a three-quarter inch radius bit and rounded over this piece of stock. I'll rip the curved part off and use that to wrap this shelf. Now using the same three quarter inch bit I made this piece earlier, I raised the bit a bit to give me this lip and that'll trim the top. Here's that molding that I made for the top of the upper case has the round over with the reveal. Now it hangs over the case, and what I want to do now is just make a 22 degree cut to form the first end. Now when I set it up to my line, you can see that the short point comes right even with the plywood. So now I can go down the other end and mark it for length. Now I can swing it the other way and make the wing cuts. Now I'm going to mark it to make the square cut. To help prevent this joint from opening up, I'm going to reinforce it with some biscuits. A little glue and a few brads will hold it in place.
Here I'm installing another quad around under the top piece. I formed it the same way as the others, and I'm just finishing it up. I've changed bits to run this profile. It's called a base cap profile for the top of base moldings. I've carefully mitered all the pieces, reinforced the joints with a biscuit, and secured it with some glue and, glue and brads. Now these little cleats will help position the upper cabinet when I set it on the base. Let's start working on these doors. The top door is going to have a glass panel, and this arch is exactly the same as the one in the lower door, which receives a wooden panel. Out on the bench, I've laid out all the stock for the doors, nice, thick, 7 8 inch poplar, and I've already started working on one of the top rails. Now, before I even started this project, I took a piece of MDF, laid out all the details, and cut it. And I really like using MDF because it's easy to cut and it's easy to make all these details nice and smooth. Now I can take this template, set it on top of the second upper rail that I need to make, center it, trace the shape, we'll cut it at the bandsaw, and we'll smooth it at our drum sander. I thought I'd bring this door over to the router table to show you the various steps we're going to go through. The first step is to make this little quarter round detail with this reveal on all the rails and styles. So I've set up a quarter inch radius bit in the router table and we're ready to go. Let's take another look at our prototype. The next step we have to do is make that quarter round on this arch. I could do that with a handheld router, but since I have the bit already set up in the table, I'm going to use it. I removed the fence so I have plenty of clearance to pivot this piece around. The important part about this procedure is to have a pivot pin. I want to bring the wood to the pin first, then bring it into the bit. If I were to just to try to come into the bit, it might catch and throw the work back. This way, I have more control. Now, once I get started and I'm up against that ball bearing, the pin is not important. I just guide it along the edge of the wood. And also, I want to keep my hands clear of the bit. The next step is to make this quarter inch wide, eighth inch deep groove on the rails and styles. So I've set up a quarter inch spiral bit. I can run all the straight pieces through the router table. To make that quarter inch groove in this shaped rail, I made a template out of some MDF. I've set up my router with a collar and that same quarter inch bit. I'll guide the collar against the template to cut the detail. Now the router leaves rounded corners. I want to sharpen those up just using a good chisel. Let's take another look at the prototype door. Just as with the antique, I'm going to plow out some material in this top rail to receive the glass panel. So I have yet another template made out of MDF. Same collar and router bit that I just used, except it's set a little bit deeper. The rails and styles for the lower door require this groove to receive the panel. So I've set up the router station with a quarter inch slot cutting bit. Just as before with the curved top, I can't use the fence. That's not quite deep enough yet, but that's the first pass to make a rabbit that I need in the styles and the bottom rail of the upper door for the glass panel. Let's take another look at one of the prototype doors. Because of all this detail, I can't just butt these pieces together. I have to create a miter where we have a molded edge. So I have to remove material from the style and clip the corners on the rail. Saw blade to full height on the table saw. Put an indicator mark which shows the leading edge of the blade. And when I run the piece in, I want to stop at those marks. Now I have to make the miter. So I've tipped the saw to 45 degrees, raised the blade so it's going to come just shy of that line, and I'll guide the piece through with my miter gauge. Now I can just snap off this piece and clean it up with a chisel. Now I've just clipped the corner of the rail so that it'll fit into the miter of the style. 
And that seems pretty good. Now I can begin to form the panel for the lower door here at the bandsaw. Well, now it's time to raise the panel or put that bevel around the edges. So I've installed a panel raising bit in the router and a start pin to get it started safely. I've slowed the router down to 10,000 RPM. I want it running as slowly as possible with a big bit like that. And I'm putting this guard in place. I want to make sure my hands are far away from that bit and that no chips can fly out at me. Now that I've taken care of the curved edges, I can do the straight sides with a conventional setup. Now the router removes most of the material in this corner, but the rest of it's done with a good sharp chisel. Well, good morning. We didn't quite finish up everything last night, so this morning we'll complete the project. I finished shaving out the panel so that that's complete. I took some time to cut pocket screws in all the rails of the doors. I've already assembled the top one, and now I'm ready to put this bottom one together. Same procedure as with the rails. A little bit of glue, and we'll clamp it and screw it together. To treat the corners on the door, on the outer edges I'm using a 3 8 inch radius bit to round it over and leave a little shoulder. With my rabbiting bit set up in the router table, I'm able to make this quarter inch by 3 16 rabbit, which allows the door to fit inside the face frame. And with that, the woodworking is done. Now it's time to paint this piece. For the finish on our cupboard, I started with an Alkid primer. And once that was dry, I gave it a good sanding to make it nice and smooth. And now I'm applying the color coat. This is called Gettysburg Gray. It's an eggshell latex paint. And it is pretty dark, so I think it's going to take a couple coats to cover this primer. All right. Here's our corner hutch out of the paint shop with two coats of that Gettysburg Gray. I think it looks great. And now I'm installing the hardware, these iron hinges. I need a mortise in the style for the lower portion of the hinge, and I need a mortise that's flush with the rabbit for the upper portion of the hinge. And in the plan, we'll tell you where you can acquire these. I think they look great, even though they cost a little bit extra. Now for the glass, I brought a template down to the local glass shop, and they cut it while I waited, a piece of double-strength glass. And the important thing here was to get these pitch cuts at the top. And that just drops into our rabbit. I made some quarter round moldings. I've mitered the corners. And now I'll just secure the pieces with some pin nails. Well, here it is. One painted corner hutch with its curved top door, iron hardware, glass panel, and a fresh coat of historic color ready for your living room or any place that fine furniture resides. Now let me show you what we're going to build next time. It's called a French side table. We found the antique that inspired it in a private collection on the island of Nantucket. It's made out of solid walnut with these graceful cabriole legs. And it's a great size. It could be in the living room or even used as a bedside table. So come on, join us next time and build one along with us right here in the New Yankee Workshop.